Can everybody see the slides? You can just do a, a thumbs up or, okay, perfect. All right, so it is 10.02, so I do wanna respect everybody's time. Um, so we will get started. So my name is, oh, Jenny, do you wanna? Hit... You go oh, ahead. <laughs> do you wanna hit the record button? Oh yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Wait, did I? Are you sure? All right, let me, yeah, it, it, it is recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so my name is Kristen Hall. Um, I am a senior instructional designer um, in the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Stony Brook University. Uh, my name is Jenny Zen. I'm also a senior instructor then at South. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, fostering inclusivity um, and accessibility in the college classroom. We are going to focus a lot on digital accessibility, um, kind of tips and strategies that you can use um, for your classroom. So here are the topics we're going to cover today. Um, so they are UDL principles. Um, so learning how to incorporate these into your course. Um, inclusive syllabus design. So a lot of the digital accessibility um, tips and strategies that we will show you can apply to your syllabus. Um, even if you're not teaching an online course, a lot of times our syllabi are given to students in a digital format and an LMS. So it is important that we kind of keep these, um, uh, these tips in mind. And then some tips and strategies for inclusive assignments um, and assessments um, that you can provide to students. Um, so we will, I forgot to mention, we will be having some time at the end for question and answers. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> So first, let's look at some of the accessibility data. According to the uh, National Center of Education Statistics, NCES, there was an increase of the percentage of undergraduate students who has who reporting has have disabilities in the U.S. colleges. <clears throat> In the 2015 to 16 academic, academic year, the number was 19%. But the, now you can see uh, in the 2019 to 2020 academic year, it's 21%. So that means one out of five undergraduate students has reporting have a uh, disability. And for graduate level, uh, it, it's actually a de decrease. It was 12%, now it's 11%. But still, it shows this is a huge number. And uh, that growing number has led colleges and universities to decide to expand their support and the resources to help those students. But if you look at the lower, lower side, there is a gap between those students who, has, who have disabilities and for those students who register with their their university's accessibility office to to receive <clears throat> accommodations so a majority of students they they uh, they didn't report themselves to the to receive these resources so this give us as an education educators a very um, important awareness that we cannot assume that if a student has a disability or not based on the accommodation letter from the, the office or their self-reporting because they probably didn't tell you. And um, there could be many reasons behind it. A lot of students may not aware that they are eligible for those uh, like 70% of students with uh, mental health disabilities they didn't register because a lot of them didn't aware they are eligible for accommodations as well. So um, all these told us again, we are this this is a serious problem and we have to take a more proactive way to address this instead of waiting for someone to give us a letter, then we begin to accommodate the that student. So I want to uh want to recommend a universal design for learning as an proactive 
approach to address this issue. Universal design uh, anticipates and accommodates students with needs of all learners, not uh, necessarily only limited to students with disabilities. If you look at this picture, you see there is a staircase and there is an elevator. This is a picture, you know, we see like every day, probably in your building, in your office, in your school. People use Elevate for different reasons. Uh, a lot of times they probably use it uh, out of convenience, but for some people, this is a necessity. And, but if you want to exercise, they can still use the uh, stairs. So this is a good example that one professor told me about the universal design and uh, the inclusiveness and accessibility. That's all in the same picture. So for us, we can say um, UDL is focused on diversity because it's not only uh, address the issue for the individual learners with disability, but also with difference of learning styles and uh, even sometimes the hidden accessibility. When we design course to begin with, we use UDL. We are kind of, um, start from the beginning to make sure the course is accessible and inclusive for all learners, even in the planning stage. Even say, if my course has no students, has any, we, we don't have any students uh, with disabilities, this still provide a much better learning experience for all the students. And uh, it's also very applicable to in a variety of, um, learning environment and also for disciplines. Um, UDL at its core, it's uh, to design a learning experience in flexible ways to meet the needs of individual learners. So it comes with three guiding principles. Um, let's see the next slide. Yeah, representation. You probably already applied this to your course because these days it's very common sense. Students would not just uh, have uh, have to read the textbook. There's other resources like videos, like uh, pictures, slides, PowerPoints, which would uh, help them to learn better. So we would definitely uh, recommend multiple ways to represent the course learning materials. Action and expression. This is how students can demonstrate their mastery of the skills. So you can mix a different format of assessment, not just uh, like all these courses only have three multiple choice exam. You can use um, group projects or uh, assignments and or you can use a different format for assignments for students to submit their assignments. Like instead of um, PowerPoint, they can submit a video. Instead of live presentation, they can do some other formats like interview or active learning, role play. And uh, <clears throat> the last one, engagement. This is even more important because if students are not engaged, they will not learn. And these days it's even more important with the challenge of generative AI. You want to get students into action in the learning. So that's why uh, group, projects, group work, and uh, uh, in the classroom, you can do uh, active learning activities to make sure students are engaged. So let's see. Five easy ways to apply to my class as an educator. Uh, <clears throat> regularly assess your student of their understanding and provide uh, constructive meaningful feedback to support their learning and also build um, self-assessment, self-reflection in your class. If you are teaching classroom class, you can uh, provide a modest point action at the end of the course session. And if it's online, you can provide a quick survey just to learn how students, where are they? How's their learning going? And uh, give them help. Present, uh, provide more away from more than one way to getting things done. 
this is like give option to the students. So instead of uh, let them choose their project titles and or uh, choose what kind of uh, format they can they want to submit their work. The third one, contextualize, um, give very clear instruction for your assignments and also um, rubrics. And it, or if you don't provide rubrics, you should provide a, a sample work as a benchmark. So resources, we already talked about the different format of learning resources, but you can uh, like record a weekly wrap up video or summarize the uh, their weekly discussion board to provide a more personalized learning material for students. This would uh, make it more relevant and engage the students. Uh, the last one we talked about assessment. So um, to accommodate different uh, diverse needs, instead of traditional assessment, you can try oral exams or portfolios. I know uh, some professors do this to counterpart the challenge of AI. Yeah, so this is an option out there. So the last piece I want to mention is a very simple tool that you can use to do a self-check. Uh, this is a UDL rubric. It comes with three levels, traditional, enhanced, and exemplary syllabus. So for, it, it actually has more than this column, this, this row, but I just give this one as an example. You can see if you are doing textbook, traditionally you just list recommended and required. But enhanced, you, you would uh, provide a purchase link and also uh, the reason why this, this was selected. And the to, do, to do one step further, you can also provide electronic e equivalent. Or uh, I would say um, if there is a rental option for students to reduce the cost. So you can just look at your own syllabus, see how which column you, your syllabus fall into. So now I'll turn over to my colleague, Kristen. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot, a lot about now some digital accessibility um, tips and strategies. Um, but the very first thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, if you're not already aware of them, is the US Department of Education Office of Civil Rights has a video series now. Um, so this is the link to their video series. Um, they have probably about, I would say 15 or 20 videos. They're very short. They're about three to five minutes and they go over different topics within accessibility and they really explain things really well. Um, so if this is something that um, in your school, if you wanted to share with faculty, um, this is a great resource to kind of get a little bit of information on um, the topics that we will discuss. Um, I will also provide, so you will get these slides at the end and you can see the little icon for the Department of Education in the, the top left-hand corner here. So on the slides where there is a um, US Department of Education video, um, I will, that's linked at the bottom and I'll, I will point that out and you will see that icon. So the first thing um, that I recommend is simple formatting tips. Um, so in any type of um, document that you are providing to your student or on in the, the LMS, you want to use a sans serif font. Um, and you want to use the same font throughout the document. So when you, specifically your syllabus, um, a lot of times I know we copy and paste from semester to semester, um, but when our fonts are different sizes or there are different types of fonts, it can make the document look very disorganized and scattered. Um, so I do recommend, you know, you can just do control A on your computer um, and then change the font and the font size so that it all matches throughout the document. But here you can see the difference between a sans serif font. Um, so there's no, um, what they call these like little kind of like feet at the end of um, the letters. Um, so the sans serif doesn't have that and then the serif fonts do. So you can see here it is an example of two different fonts. The next tip is to left align your text as much as possible. So you want to avoid right alignment and um, specifically justified text. So I know sometimes we'll justify, but that's when we get lots of um, spaces or uneven spaces between words, which can make things difficult to follow. 
um, in a document. So wherever you can, I would highly recommend to do a left align. Centered is okay, but you really wanna save that for titles. Um, you don't want to center text completely because again, that is more challenging to read than left align, but it is okay to use um, sparingly, especially when you're using headings, um, which I'll talk about in just a bit. You also want to avoid capitalizing all text for emphasis. Um, so you can see here, I have a best practice where we just say all assignments for this class are due on Saturdays at 11.59 PM. That's a very um, common for online courses. And then uh, below that, you can see how it's all in capitals. So I know that sometimes this is done for emphasis, that we wanna emphasize that this is really important, but it can come across as shouting or yelling. So in today's society, within texting, if we text um, with all capital letters, it just, you, you wonder why the person's yelling at you or angry or in an email. <laughs> um, it doesn't come across very, very well. So you want to try to avoid using all capitals. Um, you can capitalize maybe like a word, um, but I wouldn't capitalize an entire sentence or an entire paragraph. Um, it'll, it is also more challenging to read than it is just to have the, the regular text. You also want to avoid large blocks of text. Um, so you can see here, I have an example on the left where I have um, something that would be on a syllabus for response time and feedback on assignments. And I have bullet points. The text on the right says the exact same thing. I've, there's just more filler language um, in the paragraph. So as you can see, it's very hard to follow and you don't really wanna read it. <laughs> so. Um, when you have really large blocks of text, you wanna see how can I minimize that? Where can I take out unnecessary words? And can this be put into a bullet point um, format instead? So that way this chunks the information um, and it kind of guides the reader through what's important. Um, so on the, on the left, I can you know, clearly see like what are the specific points in that paragraph? And on the right, I, I just don't wanna read it at all because it, it's too long. <laughs> So here you can see um, headings and subheadings. So these are really important in digital documents and also um, in your LMS, depending on the LMS that you use at your institution. We use Brightspace, D2L Brightspace at Stony Brook, which I'll show you kind of how you can use headings and subheadings within Brightspace. Um, but any kind of Word document um, or PDF that you're using, you want to make sure that you're using headings and subbing, subheadings. So these make it much easier to scan a document. It chunks information into kind of more meaningful parts. Um, when you are doing any sort of digital reading, we do this much more often than we do in a printed document. So there's kinds of, there's research on how we read digitally versus how we read um, in print. And headings and subheadings can definitely help to direct the learner um, towards the important information. This is also really important for screen readers. So if you don't have any headings or subheadings, the screen reader is gonna start from the document from the very top. And the person using the screen reader has no way to navigate through the document. So it's always gonna start from the beginning and then go all the way to the end. Um, when you have headings and subheadings, they can kind of skip around and skip to the different sections. So we use this in our syllabus um, template. And we also helps to generate a table of contents as well. So people can, um, using the document, can skip down to specific sections. Um, so you can see here on the bottom, I do have the icon for the Department of Education. And so there are specific videos on headings and subheadings um, that you can view um, through their website. And this is um, um, an example of a Brightspace um, page. Um, so again, we do use D D2L Brightspace. And they have something called document templates, which are really helpful in creating content within the LMS. And this is where you can see how we have, um, this is heading one, heading two, and heading three. So you can see the size of the font changes, um, and it helps to just chunk that information and guide learners through what is in that content. So then we have images. Um, so based on cognitive theory of multimedia learning, you really wanna to try to avoid using unnecessary images that have nothing to do with the content that you're presenting. Um, so any sort of decorative graphics, 
um, really actually hinder learning. Um, so that contributes to what they call extraneous processing. Um, so we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So you really only want to include images and graphics that are absolutely needed or help in um, learning or retaining the information or the concepts that you are teaching. And this is the same for your syllabus as well. Um, when you include any images um, throughout your um, course or throughout your syllabus, you also want to provide um, alt text um, so that um, if a screen reader is going through the document that it would be able to um, describe that image. So tables is a very common thing that we see in syllabi, especially at our institution. Um, a lot of faculty, and we actually put this in our syllabus template, we um, use it for um, organization of assessments, assignments, also a course schedule. But the way you format your tables is really important. So this is also um, um, accessibility in terms of um, screen readers and being able to read the content in a table. So when you have any sort of tables, you want to avoid any sort of merged cells or split cells. So you can see the example here. Um, so we have that header row on top and there's two columns, but there's one cell under those two columns. So you don't want to do that. And then also under the second column, you can see I have one column, but then there's two cells in that one column on that row. Um, and the same thing there for the, the horizontal split and the um, along with the vertical split cells. So anytime where you are gonna be merging a cell or splitting a cell within a table, you want to avoid doing that. Um, and that just makes it really difficult for a screener to navigate the table and understand the formatting and kind of what you're trying to communicate. You also wanna to try to test the tab order. Um, so this is very simple to do. You just kind of put your cursor into the top cell of the, um, the table and you just use the tab um, on your keyboard and see if you can navigate the document without using a mouse. And where does it take you? Is it in the logical order? Is that the way that the information is being presented in that tab order? Does that make sense? Um, so you also want to use um, the header row. You need to designate as a header row. And that is to explain the content that would be in each column. Um, you can also do this for the, um, there's like a row header as well. Um, where on the left-hand side, so if we go back to um, this here, well, that one's merged, so that's not a great example, but um, the last column um, where all the rows, it's kind of like a, a row header as well. Um, it can be challenging to format those, so you can format those a lot better in Word than you can in Google Docs. So I find Google Docs is really focuses on that top um, header instead of um, kind of the, that side header. Um, you also want to make sure that your header row is being repeated if your table goes over two pages. So whatever that top header row is, you want to make sure that if you go on to that second page that that um, header row appears again. And that is an option within um, Word and also in Google Docs in order to um, uh, format the table in that way. The last tip is that sometimes what will happen is that in a specific row, you'll have information and then it goes onto that second page. And so the row actually splits. Um, so there's an option in Word to avoid that as well. So then it will just kind of um, put that entire, all the content that's in that row on that second page. So the next thing here is hyperlinks. So you want to use descriptive language to communicate hyperlinks. So very common, you can see here, this common mistake is that we link the word here, where we say click here to view the US Department of Education videos. Um, now this is, doesn't really communicate, especially when you're using screen readers, what they're going, so in screeners, they can um, um, look at the hyperlinks kind of separately. And if everything is just labeled here, then it doesn't really show the viewer, like wh what does here mean? Like, where am I going? And so then if you have five of those, you just have five here's um, and it doesn't really indicate what that link is about. So the best practice is to actually just link the page um, and use descriptive language. So you can see here on the left-hand side, I have view the US Department of Education video on hyperlinks, and then I hyperlinked US Department of Education video on hyperlinks. Um, so that way it communicates when you click on that, where it's sending you. 
Um, so again, you want to try to avoid any sort of click here or to view something, go here, um, or any other way where you're not actually communicating where you're sending um, your viewer. So I do wanna talk a little bit about Ally. Um, so we have this within Brightspace. I do know that this is also an option in Blackboard. I believe it is a Blackboard product. Um, so other, depending on the LMS that you use at your institution, um, you may have this as well. So this is a really great tool to check accessibility within your learning management system. So you can see I have these little gauges. So this is a, um, an example of pages that I have in one of my courses. And then the gauges all the way on the right-hand side, you can see they're all different shades of green. So the first three are good, they're perfect, they're green. Um, but the last one you can see, it's not as green as the other ones. And there's also, it'll be yellow or it'll just flat out be red. Be like, it's not accessible at all. Um, so when you click on these gauges, um, so you can do that here. I can, when I clicked on that one, it said it was at 99%, which is great, um, but it tells me that this HTML file contains links with missing text. So just like what I described before on how I um, didn't um, uh, describe the link. So in this course, I actually talk about what we're talking about right now about using hyperlinks, and I did an example of click here to learn more. So that's what it's picking up on that I did not use descriptive text in order to um, describe that link for click here. Um, but I didn't change it because that was, that was meant to be that way to, to, to demonstrate uh, what, we, what we shouldn't be doing. Um, but this is a great tool that if you have this within your LMS at your university, um, that can help you go through your course content within your LMS to, to decide and help you see if things are, are accessible or not. It does also, I believe, scan like PDFs and certain documents to see if those are also um, accessible. So one of the things that we want to try to avoid is um, excessive use of color um, and depending on the way that you're using color. So the most readable text is black font on a white background. Some people also prefer the opposite um, where it is white font on a black background, um, but for most people, the most readable font is that black font on a white background. Um, I don't know the exact statistics, but um, there is, you know, there is more, pe more people out there that are colorblind um, that we realize, and that is definitely one of those invisible um, disabilities that, you know, may not, never be communicated to you as an instructor. So um, we have, um, um, this, um, well, we don't have it, but <laughs> there's a color contrast checker um, called Web Aim Color Contrast Checker. And this is something that you can go, at, you can do yourself and you can look at what the color contrast um, is of certain um, um, materials. So I wanted to just show what this looks like. So one of the things that um, I see commonly is this kind of color combination on the bottom here where things are in red and they're highlighted in yellow. And a lot of times you wanna do this for emphasis and communicating to the students. This is really important. You wanna make sure to um, really pay attention to what I'm saying here. Um, but when we go to the color contrast checker, so this is web aim. So what you can do, I already did this one here, but what you can do is you just kind of click on the color picker here and then you can get an eyedropper. So if you look at that eyedropper right here, I'll just click on that. And then it comes to where I can just click on any color on my screen. Um, so I'll just click on the yellow. Oh, actually you can't do it here. Um, <laughs> well, we can do it right here. But if I click on the yellow, then it'll just kind of give me that hex value. If you already know the hex number of the color, you can put it in here as well. Um, but you can see I have the yellow background and I have the red foreground and you can see that this fails the color contrast checker. So for someone who um, may be colorblind and some are just specific colors from, you know, completely, this will be very difficult for them to read. So something that you're trying to put a lot of emphasis on that this is really, really, really important. Um, some students may not really be able to read it very well. Okay. So just something to keep in mind. I do this a lot. I will, um, I go on our website and I'm like, does this pass our color contrast um, checker? And so you just kind of want to be careful with these types of um, um, colors. I mean, I've, sometimes I've seen 
even like pink or green or, you know, just really trying to emphasize certain things, but not everybody may be able to really read it um, that well. The other thing that you want to do is you want to avoid using color as the only way of communicating information. So for example, if I had put at like the top of my syllabus that like all due dates are in red, and then I just highlight, you know, I just made all the dates for everything in red. But for me, if I'm colorblind and I can't really see the color red, like how am I able to distinguish between is that um, is that a due date or is that not a due date, um, you know, kind of on your syllabus. So anytime you're, you have any sort of using color, that shouldn't be the only way of communicating that information. So you can still use it. I mean, I wouldn't highlight this like this, um, but you also want to give another indication. So for example, you would put due date in front of it. So that if someone can't really distinguish between those colors, um, there is another indicator for them to be able to see what that, that due date is. Um, so you can see here, I have a screenshot of that um, color contrast checker where um, this fails. So we, want, we, don't, we don't want to highlight things in red anymore. So this next section, I'm just going to go over some information about prom promoting um, inclusivity within your courses and within your syllabi. So we want to make, um, as much as possible, we want to try to have a welcoming tone um, to our syllabus and so any sort of communication that we are um, sending to students. Um, so you can see here I have um, on the left hand side where we have some welcoming language and then some other language that we may consider to revise. Um, and it's not necessarily that it is being uh, rude or abrasive, it just may not be as welcoming um, inviting kind of students in. Um, so for example, here we have um, about office hours. So it's just, if you have any questions, I welcome you to attend my office hours on Wednesdays. Um, and Fridays, or you may email me to schedule an appointment. And so the other one here is just office hours are scheduled on Wednesdays. So it just seems very abrupt. Um, so we can kind of add a little bit more of this language um, to have a welcoming um, tone. And again, I also have an example here for late work. Um, so we're talking about kind of if you have a late work policy, what is that? Instead of being very, very rigid, uh, late work will not be accepted under any circumstances. The other thing that we want to try to consider is our course content and resources. So we want to try to consider resources from diverse perspectives and backgrounds. Um, so kind of taking a look at the, your discipline and kind of what kinds of um, um, resources are you providing to students and does this represent diverse perspectives. Um, so kind of, kind of taking a deep dive into that and the live librarians are really great in order to help with this if you don't know where to start. We also recommend when possible to consider OERs, which are open educational resources or open source materials. So what these allow is for students to have access um, to these materials on day one. Um, so sometimes for textbook costs, which I'm sure many of you are aware are kind of through the roof. Um, they have um, skyrocketed over the past, um, I would say 10 or 15 years. And for some students, this is definitely a challenge and they may not have the funds to purchase those textbooks or purchase them right away. So for some students who have financial aid, they may be getting a refund, um, but that doesn't really come usually until like week two, three or four of this semester in order to be able to purchase their books. So if they have to wait for those funds to do that, then they are already behind because they, have not, they do not have access to all the course materials um, from day one of the course. Open educational resources or open source materials are free. Um, you can also adapt them and use them depending on the Creative Commons license that is attached to them um, to fit your, your course needs. Um, but this gives students a day one access to this material. So it is more inclusive. Um, so we do have a link here to our open educational resource libguide. Um, but I also encourage you to look at your institution and librarians um, because they probably also have similar resources um, for you at your school. And these, um, we have usually linked to something called OER Commons, which provides um, some ac um, links to these kinds of open educational resources. A lot of these textbooks that are there, um, OpenStax is another one. Um, they tend to be more lower level courses. Um, kind of like gen ed courses. So if you're teaching a more um, 
um, upper division or a specific course. There may not be a specific textbook available for you, but you can also look into maybe some other open source materials or materials that are provided to the library where you can provide resources so students don't have to necessarily pay for those, um, for those resources. Um, so this kind of, um, kind of piggybacks off a little bit of what Jenny had talked about earlier. Um, so when we go into assignments and grading, we wanna try to break down large assignments into smaller parts. Um, so for example, if you have a research paper due, you know, like a 15, 20 page re research paper due at the end of the semester, we wanna to try to break that down um, into manageable parts that students can kind of follow and having due dates throughout the semester. So this helps to kind of keep them on track. Um, it teaches them some self-regulation skills. It teach them, teaches them the process rather than just kind of, you know, pulling an all-nighter, you know, one or two days before the paper's due and then handing in something that may not be up to standards. Um, so the way you can kind of break this down for a research paper is, you know, have a due date for their topic and their resources, a first draft. You can include a peer review in there um, and their final draft. And along the way, they're getting feedback on this so that by the time they're handing in that final draft to you, um, hopefully it's a little better quality um, than would be if they, you know, started it the night before. <laughs> You also want to provide a brief description of each assignment on your syllabus. So it doesn't need to be the full breakdown of each assignment, but giving students kind of an understanding of what is their expectations that they have to um, for that course um, at the beginning of the semester. Where it's appropriate, you want to try to provide student choice. So is there kind of a culminating project that students can do? Can they do a portfolio or a presentation? Um, or an infographic um, or a written paper. Like, it depending on your course and kind of what is appropriate, but if you can provide student choice um, so they can kind of choose how they want to present to you about how they have learned or have met those learning objectives. Um, and the last thing here is we wanna avoid due dates on religious holidays. Um, so, and this is not just the religious, religious holidays that your school may be closed on, um, or kind of observing, but there are many, many different um, religions and we wanna kind of respect students um, and their religious practices. Um, I do know for, um, I feel like there tends to be a lot more of these in the fall semester, um, maybe than in the spring, but you wanna try as much as possible to avoid these. I know our university does have a listing of religious holidays throughout the semester that we can kind of reference um, so that when we're planning out when due dates are, we want to try to um, avoid these. We also wanna clearly indicate how students will be graded. So you wanna provide that breakdown to students about how much, you know, how many points or what the percentages of what these um, are, um, each component of your course is worth. We wanna to try to do frequent lower stakes assignments um, and exams rather than having just like say a midterm and a final. You also wanna consider dropping a student's lowest test or assignment score. So depending on kind of the different categories of like what you're having them do, you know, if you have say five or six, you know, knowledge checks or quizzes throughout the semester, can you drop the lowest one? I know some of our faculty will also maybe have three or four exams and they only count, say they have four exams, they only count three of them. So that gives students the opportunity that they're having a bad day um, or if they're sick or they have a headache or they're just not at their best at when they have to take an exam or submit an assignment, that it doesn't ruin their entire grade. A lot of times if this happens early on in the semester, students may just kind of give up completely because what's the point? I'm not gonna pass anyway, or I'm not gonna get a good grade anyway. And they just don't really continue on in the class. So we wanna try to give them opportunities that if something happens, you know, they still, you know, can get a decent grade in the class and still show to you that they have met their learning objectives um, and persist um, through the end of the semester. And the last thing here is use rubrics for grading. Um, I know for me, when I'm grading assignments, I'm not the same person um, when I uh, grade the first one than when I grade the last one. Um, so <laughs> to help me um, also to kind of show my expectations and kind of really what I'm looking for in assignments and also making that explicit to students so they can see it as well. So I do provide my rubrics to students ahead of time before they submit their assignments. Um, and that way it is um, more inclusive and I'm giving every student 
um, kind of the same attention to their, um, to their um, whatever they're submitting for their assignments. Um, and here's just an example of considering the weight of each assignment um, that I kind of talked about um, just before. So you can see I have two examples here of one class where maybe we have five homeworks, five knowledge checks or quizzes, three exams, and a project. Um, so I know sometimes when we think about adding in some coursework for students that that can also add in um, time for faculty um, in terms of grading. But you can see here where I have knowledge checks can be automatically graded. The exams can be auto graded depending on the type of exam that there is. Um, so maybe we're really kind of just adding in a few homeworks and a project that you can grade with a rubric. But this gives students an opportunity to um, kind of space out kind of that learning throughout the semester and also can help reduce stress. Because when we have high stakes assessments, so example on the right hand side here, if a midterm is 40% and a final is 50%, that is a lot of stress and anxiety that a student can experience, which can then affect the way they perform on those exams. Um, so we would recommend more of this kind of more frequent spaced out assessments um, rather than the um, kind of midterm final. The other thing here too, is that we see that homework is only worth 10%. So how much is that of value to a student? So if you have a homework due every week, but it's only worth 10% of the, of the class, um, is that something a student is going to necessarily put a lot of time into because it's really not worth a lot of um, a lot of their grade. So just some things to, um, to kind of consider. Um, so then we also want to um, think about supportive course policies. Um, so what is your attendance policy? Is it extremely rigid or do you allow for students to, you know, maybe miss one or two classes that are excused? Um, you know, so kind of thinking about or if there's an extenuating circumstance that you will work with that student. Also the late work policy. Um, so I know depending on the type of assignments, you may be able to accept work late up to say five days or a week after the due date um, with some sort of penalty, but allowing the students the flexibility for that. Um, I know some people, some faculty will also kind of give them um, like a late coupon of some sort where they can like one some you know one point in the semester for whatever reason for whatever assignment um, they can hand it in late no questions asked um, so this can definitely have a deadline you know maybe if you know you can hand it in a week late or two weeks late or however you determine um, works best um, for your course but they can kind of give you this coupon and be like no questions asked and they won't get any points taken off for that and then the last one here is electronics device policy. So I know this is something that comes up a lot, especially at our school, about whether or not we would allow students to use their phones or their laptops or any sort of electronic devices within the classroom setting. Um, so on the one hand, I know that sometimes we actually use these for say, um, you know, click a response questions, um, or they need to like look something up in um, a group setting. Um, in order to kind of like find resources. And in other times they can be extremely distracting, especially if students are not doing coursework or doing other coursework or shopping or doing whatever um, on their laptops during um, the course session. So um, it's hard to just say no one can use an electronic device because some students may have an accommodation where they need an electronic device in order um, to help them take notes um, or some sort of accommodation that they're, they're just allowed to have that with, with them. So if you say no electronics whatsoever, but then there are one or two students that are allowed to use it, you now have kind of unintentionally outed that student that they have a disability and accommodation. Um, so I really like the recommendation from um, this book called Inclusive Teaching by VG Safi and Kelly Hogan. They actually came to our university last year and did a presentation, they were excellent. And in their book, they talk about how they, um, they teach um, pretty large classes, but they'll have a section, like a designated section in their course where you are allowed to use an electronic device. And then the other sections of the course, you are, you are not allowed. So that way the student has the choice of where they want to sit within the course. You're not outing anybody um, that may need to use an electronic device for accommodations. And then the students who are getting distracted by other students who are doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing classes have the opportunity to kind of be in a setting that they're not experiencing those distractions. 
So I really liked that policy. Um, I think that was a very good um, and kind of inclusive solution um, to that problem. But I would highly recommend this book, Inclusive Teaching, by VG Safi and Kelly Hogan. They have a lot of great tips and strategies um, from, um, from their perspective, and it was really great. So one of the last things here is educational technologies. So we want to provide tutorials and information about any educational technologies that you're using in your course. We don't want to assume that students know how to use anything. <laughs> um, they are bombarded with lots of different technologies within their personal life and then also within school. So you don't want to assume that they know how to use them. Some of these um, technologies also aren't all that intuitive um, and can be a little clunky depending on the, the tool. So for example, we have, we have VoiceThread and obviously Zoom at our institution. Um, so VoiceThread, which I love, I think it is a great alternative um, for discussion boards but it's not 100% intuitive. So I always provide tutorials for students. It doesn't hurt the students that already know how to use VoiceThread, but for the students who have no idea or have never heard of it before, it gives them a little bit more information about how to use it. I also usually do a very low stakes assessment um, or kind of a practice using that technology before they would need to use it for something um, more of a, like an assignment they would need to submit. And this also goes for publisher software. So a lot of um, classes may use publisher software, which brings them out to kind of a third party. So you want to provide those directions and very explicit about how they access it, what they're going to experience, um, and what that looks like. So don't assume that students know. Um, and the reasoning behind that is this is an example of all the different types of technologies, educational technologies that a student at Stony Brook may experience in a single semester. <laughs> Um, so when they have, you know, one course and it's just your course about like the one technology you're using, but a lot of students are taking four or five, six courses. And so if they're each have a different publisher website, they're going out to, and they're each using different other technology and there's different apps and things aren't named the same. Um, so I know for Brightspace, we have our LMS, but their app is called Pulse. Um, so these kinds of terms and all these technologies can be very, very confusing. And it's like, where do I go? What app is that? What's happening? Um, so we want to be very explicit um, with that so that students aren't getting overwhelmed about where, where they need to go. So lastly, we just wanted to leave you with some resources. So we do have syllabus templates on our um, web, web page. So these are written, you know, kind of specific to Stony Brook and our um, policies um, and kind of you know syllabus statements that need to be on our syllabus, um, but you, you're welcome to look at them to see if um, anything could be potentially adapted um, within your institution. We've also just launched our self-paced resource guides. Um, so these are e-learning guides and we do have one on digital accessibility. So I just wanted to show you that here. Um, so these are just short little um, um, e-learning courses and you can see here we have different um, topics of most of the stuff that I just talked about um, within this presentation so that you can have um, some more resources um, to, to navigate through there. So that is available um, to anybody. Um, and we do have a few more that are coming on student engagement um, and assessment. Um, and then we have some additional resources here in, on our SASE. So if you're um, from Stony Brook, um, that's our Student Accessibility Support Center where they provide accommodations for students. Um, we have an accessibility homepage at Stony Brook University, and then we also have some resources on our website as well for CELT. Um, so these are our references. So if you want to check any of those out, um, our contact information. Um, and again, we're going to send you these slides. So if you haven't had a chance to write anything down, um, you'll have access to the slides. Um, and then we just have kind of a uh, feedback um, that we would ask for you to, to fill out um, about our presentation to give us feedback. So um, we can now open up for questions. We have about 10 more minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions. So you can feel free to put it in the chat or um, if you wanted to um, unmute yourself, that's fine as well.
if you want to share some of the best practice on your side, feel free to. So we can all learn from you, from each other. Hi, I'm Debbie Minzola. I'm from uh, Commonwealth University Bloomsburg campus. So I know we um, are very highlighted in inclusivity, which we should be, but I, I never um, drop lower grades or I never, um, you know, give the opportunity to not hand in an assignment. I, you know, I might give another opportunity to redo an assignment but um, just to keep everyone on the equal uh, standard of learning that I feel like we should treat everyone equally. If there's an expectation for an assignment, I think everyone does need to hand it in, but I don't ever drop something. I will let them redo it though. Mm -hmm. I don't know what everyone else does. Yeah, and that's that's fine too. So the recommendation to you know drop the lowest grade, um, that's not something that necessarily will work across the board for every single type of class. Um, so that's just a suggestion. So I know for, for my course, one of my courses, I do knowledge check quizzes. Um, and I think I had like eight, I think I had eight during the semester. So I dropped the lowest one so that only seven counted towards their grade. So it's something so along those lines, but if it's, it's like a oh, high sorry. stakes. Oh, go ahead. Well, we have tough semesters, like this semester is uh, very tough for our junior um, set of anesthesia students. Mm. We have more projects placed in them. So there's definitely a way to bring up that grade when the, um, the rigor of the exams are very difficult because they're doing endocrine neuro pediatrics. They have a lot of uh, kind of different uh, rigorous courses in this semester. So, mm -hmm. but thank you. Yes. Yeah. And especially I know for clinical programs. Um, so that may not be as appropriate where it's, you know, this is really important. You need to know this <laughs> um, for, for clinical and application. So, yeah. We have a question in the chat. Okay, so we have Heidi. Um, so what do you do if someone wasn't there for one of the knowledge checks? What happens to their grade? Um, so that would be for something, I my classes are online, so they have a week to do their knowledge check. Um, so for that instance, you know, if they just don't do it, then that's where they get a zero and that's the lowest grade that is dropped. Um, but if you're doing that in class, because I know a lot of times um, some faculty will do that like at the beginning of class um, to kind of make sure students are doing their readings um, or kind of reviewing what you did in, in the prior um, prior class, then um, the same thing that you can um, drop the lowest one. And if they are not there, then that's the one that gets dropped. That's the one that has the zero. Are there any other questions? Kristen, I have a question. Sure. How do you walk the line between making it, some of this stuff was, it was a great presentation. It was really clear on why you would want to implement it for inclusivity. Mm -hmm. But there are other pieces where I hesitate. And I think the last, the question before the last sort of hits on this, where I feel like students need to learn to read a paragraph. And I get the bulleting will help them see things yes. better and I'm happy to bullet in a syllabus, but I do worry that we aren't preparing students for jobs, especially I teach graduate students. Mm -hmm. If we are giving them so many opportunities to submit late work or, mm -hmm. you know, so how yes. do you walk that line of yes. actually sort of preparing them for the real world? Absolutely. So when, when we give suggestions of potentially taking late work, um, there still can be that expectation that no, everything is to be on time, that this is for, you know, an extenuating circumstance, that if you need to hand in something late, um, and sometimes depending on the timing of when you hand something in late, um, I, I personally don't think that you should be giving students like two weeks, you know, it could be like, two days or five days, however, and you'll lose, you know, however many points per day, because you still want to keep them on track for the semester. So they're not kind of like falling behind. Um, but when it also comes to, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the second part? I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, I just, I worry. And I do things oh, like paragraphs. I'm oops, sorry. Yes. Uh, you know, oops, coupon in my class so that they can, I don't have to like 
they don't have to tell me what went wrong that week. They just have one thing where they can pass in a week late. So I do yeah. have some of that because life happens. Yeah. But I worry about, I, I also have an Easter egg in my syllabus where like if you email the professor a picture of a cute animal, you'll get an extra you know, credit. Yeah, I yeah. get maybe 5% of the students actually doing that, even though their first assignment is read the syllabus. Read the syllabus. Yes, it is. It's a challenge to get them to read it. Um, but I do want to address the paragraph. Um, so I absolutely agree. Like we don't want to necessarily digest all the information for students and provide it in bulleted format. Where this really comes into play is, is your syllabus, um, that we don't want to have very large blocks of text on your syllabus and trying to, to do that to communicate. But it also has to do with like digital reading. So anything that you're providing on an LMS um, where you are writing information that would be kind of like, an, like a web-based or an HTML format, that's where you really want to digest that information for students and do bullet points. But readings, um, anything that where students you know, have access, um, if they, you know, their textbook readings or all that kind of stuff, absolutely. Like they should still be able to read those paragraphs um, or things where they can kind of print out. But really it's more of like where you're providing directions on your LMS. Um, you don't want to have like a very, very, very long paragraph for that, but any sort of like course content in that way. Um, absolutely. Like I agree, like you want to keep that content as is, and students have the option to print it out if they don't want to read it digitally. Um, but there is, um, let me see if I can find it. There is information and research on, um, from the Nielsen Norman group. Um, so you can see here, um, on the way that we read digitally. So there's something called the F-shave pattern um, where it kind of, they've done studies about how using like, um, like heat sensors and kind of visually like where students are, or not students, but just people read digitally. Um, and this was really used for kind of web-based stuff. But if you think about information that we're presenting on an LMS is web-based. So there's a lot of research that talks about how we view information and what we're actually paying attention to and what we're reading. So anything that you're providing in that digital format, I would highly recommend to kind of break that down for students using those headings and subheadings. But that doesn't mean that you need to digest that, their course content for them that they have in readings or textbooks or anything like that. Thank you, that's helpful. And I can provide the link to this, um, to this research group too, because I found it really, really helpful in the way that I, um, try to present my information. Any other questions? I think you might have answered it. I mean, you talked about the research, but there were several um, links in the chat. And mm -hmm. I was I was hoping to be able to get that because I don't know what was going on, why I and something with the connectivity because I was going in and out. And then once you're out, when you go back in, you yes, don't you lose. Have... Yes, absolutely. So all the links that um, Jenny did share in the chat are provided also in the PowerPoint slides. And we will share all of those with you. So you'll have direct access to those links in the PowerPoints. Yeah. Well, the thanks. last uh, slide, the last link I share is actually the slide. So you can uh, go ahead and uh, take it to allow oh, for download. Yeah. yeah. And I do just want to emphasize, too, that all of the tips and strategies that we talked about today, um, and especially in terms of like assignments, um, assessments and grading, all that kind of stuff, um, it doesn't mean that you have to do all of it. <laughs> um, that we don't necessarily, you know, maybe you're taking like one or two things to kind of try within your course, um, but it's not to have an inclusive course doesn't mean or to, to be more inclusive in your course doesn't mean that you have to adopt everything that we kind of talked about today. Um, the one exception to that I would say would be some of those digital accessibility tips and strategies that we had with like hyperlinks, headings, um, and tables and stuff like that. We want to try to incorporate those things. But those other things, if there's one thing that's like, oh, I really want to try that in my class, um, trying to take it step by step. We don't want to necessarily feel like you have to overhaul your entire course um, in order to try to be um, more inclusive. All right, so it is 11 a.m. now. Um, so we will stick around for a little more um, if you have any other questions. <clears throat> um, I do see we have one in here for the F pattern reading. Yes, I will, I will link that right now in the chat. This has been great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you.
I accidentally sent it to one person. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you everybody for joining us yeah. today. Yeah, please take the survey. Thanks. <laughs>